welcome everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and get started so that we have some time at the end for some questions and answers. But first of all, welcome to everyone to Emerald Diagnostic Clinic and our practice, her care. We've been here now for a year, so we're we're hunkered down and in for the long haul. I am Dr. Joanna Wilson. I'm an internist. My partner here is Frida Toller. She's a nurse practitioner. We do women's health and internal medicine. So the, the practice is internal medicine for women only. Head to toe, one stop shopping, and uh, we also focus on um, menopause management and osteoporosis and those things that happen um, exclusively, if not more often, in women. Thank you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so um, let's get started. Uh, first of all, welcome to everyone. This is fantastic for me. This is a, uh, it's a lot of work to put together any of these, of these talks that I do. So um, having a full house is a lot more fun than having a, um, a small house. So we're going to talk today about your bellies and the importance of the bacteria that live inside of us. So let's get started. We are, in fact, as humans, 99% bacterial. So, as the uh, Bonnie Bassler says in her TED talk, she says, you see human, I see bacterial. And, and the relationship between our bacteria and our bodies plays a role basically in everything that happens to us. So let's explore the concept of mutualism. This is a word that you probably heard back in high school biology. And it's the interplay between two species that have benefits to both species. Now humans have about 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells. And between 300 and 1,000 species of bacteria live in our intestines. And about 99% of those are anaerobes, meaning they cannot be exposed to air or they'll die. And this also presents some difficulties in culturing and studying these bacteria that live in us because they are difficult to grow in, in regular labs. So the intestinal bacteria in us have allowed us to obtain greater nutrients from our foods, they help us develop sophisticated immune systems, and they help us balance our emotions and our cognition. And let's start at the beginning. We are colonized by our mothers. So in we, when we grow in the uterus, we're sterile. It's a totally sterile environment. And the passage through the vaginal tract is what colonizes us. And the, interestingly, the vaginal bacteria that our mothers grew actually changed during pregnancy in order to grow bacteria that allowed us to metabolize the milk that we were about to consume. Now you might say, but what happens for C-section babies? Interestingly, C-section babies are colonized with a different group of bacteria than vaginal birth babies. Now, this may or may not be an important thing. To this, to this day, we believe that babies born in C-section lead long, healthy lives, and there's probably not a long-term change. But what we are learning now is that some diseases that may be um, related to bacterial health uh, may in fact start from the very beginning. So breast milk is the original prebiotic and probiotic. Breast milk contains over 600 different kinds of bacteria. And it also is rich in the oligosaccharides, the, the milk sugars that, that transfer through the baby's uh, colon and in fact feed the bacteria that live in the colon. Those bacteria break down those sugars and then the baby is fed. So let's take a quick peek. This picture on the right is your colon. When you have a colonoscopy, this is exactly the pictures that the doctor sees. And it looks very smooth and it looks very benign, right? You can eat off of it. <laughs> but if you look a little bit closer, you see in this electron micrograph, some bacteria that live in the little nooks and crannies. Look a little closer now, and this is, a, this is a slice of a colon, and you see that these little dots up here are bacteria. So all on the colon, you see that the bacteria will clump. Now these are not one different kind, or one uh, solitary kind of bacteria. These are many, many different kinds of bacteria thousands and thousands. In fact, probably intermixed in this 
are some yeast and some viruses and some things that just make us who we are. Why do we need colon bacteria? Well, a lot of what we eat, we can't absorb. All of the, the, the vegetables and a lot of the fruits and a lot of the grains, um, some parts of, of proteins that we eat, we can't absorb without our bacteria. In fact, we know that germ-free animals are terribly malnourished. Germ-free humans can be terribly mal malnourished. So we must have bacteria inside us to help us break down the, the nutrients that we consume. So colon bacteria improve our absorption of vitamins and minerals. We, uh, it affects the cholesterol metabolism, so the, the amount of bile that needs to be made and the reabsorption of the bile. So, so this really actually impacts our heart disease risk because cholesterol metabolism is very closely related to heart disease. And it also generates some vitamins, our, our biotin and our thiamine and vitamin K. In fact, if anyone of you are, are familiar with Coumadin, the product Coumadin for blood thinning, you know that it's a vitamin K dependent blood thinner. And what happens in someone who takes vitamin K and then also takes antibiotics, right? The vitamin K is gone because the bacteria are gone and the effect of the Coumadin now becomes super therapeutic. The blood gets too thin because there's no vitamin K to, to, to factor that out. So let's think of this colonization that occurs at birth and then as we, as we become toddlers and, and consume solid foods, let's think of it as ground cover. So the bacteria that we grow initially, that our bodies uh, become colonized with, is then now recognized as us. And our immune systems will be able to separate us from them. And the, the bacteria that, that settle in first, we recognize as us. Now how do bacteria in the colon keep other bacteria out? They keep out the riffraff by occupying the receptors on the, the cells of the lumen of the, of the bacterial or the uh, intestinal lining. They also release products like mucus and also other toxins that keep other bacteria out of the way. So if everything is in balance, we have plenty of good bacteria that keep the neighborhood nice and clean and keep the other guys out. When the bacteria colonize our, our colons, our immune systems activate and, and become responsive to the bacteria in the colon. Now, germ-free mice, I'll use this term a couple times, germ-free mice are literally mice that are born and never given the opportunity to be colonized by any sort of colon bacteria. So they're, they're sterile, they're, their guts are sterile. And lots of experiments are done with these germ-free mice. They can, the scientists can colonize these germ-free mice with one particular strain or with a group of bacteria and then see what happens. They can also do transplant experiments where they take uh, bacteria from one group of mice and then give it to these germ-free and see what happens. So these poor germ-free mice um, are, are allowed to, to let li live and what they discovered are the natural killer cells of these immune systems went haywire. And these germ-free mice had more asthma and more inflammatory bowel disease than yeah. mice who were colonized as normal. And the question is, how does this happen? How does the, the bacteria that live in our colon modify our immune systems? If you were to look back at the, at the micrograph that I showed with the, with the uh, sample of the intestinal lining, you saw that those cells live right next to each other. They're tightly packed. And those are called gap junctions, how, how tightly packed they are. Now in instances of inflammation, those tight junctions loosen up and it gives bacteria the opportunity to just go right in and create a lot of inflammation inside the intestinal cells. Now it's not just the bacteria, but it's the, it's the bacterial toxins that really start this inflammatory party going. 
And so once, once the bacteria are inside, at that point inside the cells, then the immune system really starts to take notice. The spleen starts to develop um, immunity or antibodies to it. The liver starts to get excited. So this whole inflammatory environment happens. And so we know that the bacteria that live in the colon have an intimate conversation with the immune system in our bodies. Very, very important. So what happens if this communication or if this self versus non-self identity gets confused? There are certain diseases now that we have as, that we develop as humans that have a role, that the bacteria have a role in. Now I'm not saying that these diseases are only due to the intestinal bacteria, but there is a sequence of events. The planets align so that this person is susceptible, they have the genes, and then they probably have some sort of disruption in the colon bacteria that then set off an inflammatory environment. So diabetes type 1 is an autoimmune disease where the, the antibodies in that person attack the pancreas and, and attack the insulin producing cells. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, lots and lots of research now being done on these inflammatory diseases that probably do play a role in the, in the gut host reaction. So we are, as a society, obsessed with cleanliness, aren't we? We carry germ gel in our purses and we wipe our baby's pacifiers. We'll even go so far as to throw them away and get a new one if it touches the floor. And that is impacting our health as a society. And not only are we absorbing chemicals in our systems that we don't know what they do, but we are also affecting how the bacteria that are supposed to be protecting us, once we wipe those away, what happens after that? We know that the incidence of asthma and allergy is on the rise in our children. We also know that this, this finding correlates very closely with the fact that a lot of our kids now are born without being infected with the H. pylori antigen, the bacteria. And so let me say a word quickly about H. pylori. H. pylori is a type of bacteria that at one point in our lives infects almost everybody. And in certain people, it creates problems like ulcers or gastritis. But in a lot of people, it just kind of hangs out there and it does nothing. And so back 100 years ago, about 95% of people were infected with H. pylori. And now, only about 5% of kids are, are infected as toddlers. And so here is another strong correlation between the fact that we are sterilizing ourselves and in fact suffering some repercussions from being so clean. We also know that people who are born by C-section have a higher rate of allergies and asthma also. So let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the central nervous system and the brain. And we kind of like to think as doctors and in medical school, we kind of like to think of our organs as operating independently from each other. The heart doesn't have anything to do with the kidneys and, and, and all that. But, but we are learning more and more that there is a very complex conversation going on, especially between the brain and the gut. Now, we know that these germ-free mice that I was re referring to before do not develop the same behavioral characteristics as regularly colonized mice. In fact, they tend to be calmer. They tend to have less anxiety than bacterially normal mice. And so they have done experiments with these germ-free mice. And they have shown that with different kinds of bacterial colonizations in these germ-free mice, 40 different genes are altered by having been colonized early in the, the baby mice childhood. So there is a very, very big role of early colonization of the colon bacteria with how the brain works. But timing is everything. So they can also tell that when they go back and these germ-free mice grow up 
and they try to colonize these germ-free mice with other bacteria, nothing happens. The, the mice don't change. And so there is a critical window of opportunity where little baby animals get colonized and, and this normal sequence of events happens. We've all probably experienced an upset tummy when we've been nervous, right? Have you ever stopped to think, why is that? What, why, was, why would my gut respond to how I feel? Well, these germ-free mice might have the answer for us. So again, the scientists colonize these bacteria into these germ-free mice and were able to show that there were areas in the brain that had more serotonin and more dopamine and more epinephrine as a result of the bacterial colonization. Human studies are actually being done too. It's not all about mice. We can't you know, assume that because it happens to mice, it happens to us. A very interesting study that was done out of UCLA, where they took a group of women, just regular, everyday women. They split them into two. Um, two groups, not two halves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so half of the group were, were given yogurt with probiotics, and half the group were given yogurt without probiotics. And what they showed were, given the exact same tests that these women had to perform emotional judgments, the women who were given the probiotic yogurt actually scored a little bit less intensely on emotion, and they, turned, they were less intense on their uh, sensitivity. So even just, this is a four week long study, so even a relatively short duration of probiotic intake can alter the, the neurotransmitters that are being affected in our brains. So we owe a lot to mice, a lot to mice. Scientists took these little mice with these little bottoms and put little balloons inside their little bottoms and blew up these little balloons and judged how much pain they, they seemed to be in. And then they get these little, I know, we're awful humans, but it's all for good, right? Um, and then they gave these little mice, the, excuse me, rats, they gave these little rats um, specific bacteria to see what would happen. And they found that certain bacterial additions reduced the pain perception in these, in these rats. So we, we, can, we can at least have pilot studies of, of the hypothesis that what we, what we have in our colons will actually change how we perceive pain. They also showed that lactobacillus induced opioid and cannabinoid receptors in the intestinal endothelial cells, or epithelial cells. So, so here, lots of receptors are being triggered by these different bacteria that we never, we never thought of before. So why does the brain communicate with the gut so closely? The gut is one of the few organs that is almost exposed to everything in our environment. Water, soil, foods, the, there, is, there is a very great need for the gut to protect us. And so there has to be a very intimate conversation between the brain and the gut in order for, for us to survive. Now how do the brain and the gut communicate? They communicate in basically three ways, which is, which is unique to, to this organ. Um, the vagus nerve is one of the cranial nerves. The second way is through the bloodstream, so, so certain, certain hormones get produced and get sent up to the, to the brain through the blood, and then through the spinal cord itself, through the parasympathetic and the parasympathetic uh, nervous systems. And what this allows for is near instant response from the brain. So if you eat something bad, bam, out it goes. If you get infected with something, you're going to empty your, your bowels. Your brain is going to respond very quickly, even before these bacteria have time to reproduce and, and set up shop. Your brain is already all over it. You're probably familiar with the terms of these, these uh, neurotransmitters that we the bacteria use, noradrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, these are all the neurotransmitters and the antidepressants that we use in FDA approved drugs. And they are maintained throughout different species. So cows use the same neurotransmitters, 
Um, cats use the same neurotransmitters and bacteria use the same neurotransmitters. And interestingly, we think of serotonin only being in the brain, but the greatest concentration of serotonin is actually in our guts. So if any of you have ever taken the serotonin reuptake inhibitors for anxiety or depression and you got diarrhea from it, there's a good reason why. It stimulated the gut. So here's a quick list of the research that has been done so far to show that certain bacteria can make certain neurotransmitters. So for instance, lactobacillus makes GABA. And let's talk about GABA for just a second. GABA is a, is a neurotransmitter that helps calm everything down. It's one of those kind of sedating neurotransmitters. And people actually can take GABA even though it's not FDA approved, but it's, a, it's one of the supplements that can act as an anti-anxiety drug. Now, won't it be interesting someday if we can discover that lactobacillus or supplementing with other bacteria that produce GABA actually respond in anti-anxiety therapeutic ways? And then the other, the other bacteria are very interesting too. Again, the norepinephrine, um, e. coli redu er, produces serotonin, so lots and lots of crosstalk in our guts and our brains. Stress in the belly. We've talked a little bit about um, the, the gap junctions and how those gap junctions separate and allow bacteria to get into the body and the bacterial toxins to, to cause inflammation. Now what that ends up happening is it, it changes the the immune response so that now these bacteria can reproduce and become infections. What's the difference between an infection and a colonization? It's really about how much inflammation is going on. So at this point in time we are all colonized with bacteria in our noses, in our ears, in our mouths, in our underarms, on our feet. We have bacteria actually in yeast all over us. Are we infected? No, because we are in perfect harmony. We have a balance of they need a little from us, we need a little from them, everything's fine. But if the system is perturbed, either by our own emotional stress or by our behaviors, then infection happens. So what do we do that makes us not healthy? Well, probably the one thing that, that is very prevalent in our society is food that is highly processed. So if it comes in a box and it has a lot of preservatives, if it comes in a, a wrapped up piece of paper, you can assume, you know, if it was handed to you by someone that, that is about to graduate high school, you can assume it has a lot of preservatives and, and chemicals in it that our bacteria and our colons do not want. In fact, at best, what we consume is non-nutritive. At worst, it actually may be harmful. So, you, I don't know how many of you guys read uh, CNN Health and ABC News and, and all of these, these media things now really focusing on sugars and artificial sweeteners. So we know that sugars in our diets will, will alter the bacterial <coughs> composition in our colons. Actually, artificial sweeteners will too. And so far, we can't tell you why or how because, because they should, or at least that we hope that they are inert, but they're clearly not inert. These bacteria are seeing these molecules and they're responding in ways that in some people can really create a lot of upset tummy. We also have the incorrect assumption that supplements are good or neutral at best. But in fact, that may not be the truth. And that supplements and may promote certain kind of bacterial balances in our colons that may be helpful, maybe not. Take for instance, the isoflavones, which are the phytoestrogens that a lot of times, myself included, we will recommend for uh, treatment of menopause symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, things like that. And the assumption is, well, it's probably going to be okay. <clears throat> we know, interestingly, that only a fraction, maybe about 6 out of 10 women, are going to have any kind of response from these isoflavones because it takes a certain colony of bacteria in our colons 
to, to actually convert those chemicals into usable substances. So if you don't have those bacteria, those supplements aren't gonna do anything. But what I can tell you is, the study that, that I'm referencing here is that these isoflavones did change the, the bacterial balance in these study um, subjects. So, so supplements do have an impact. The other interesting article that's referenced here is L-carnitine supplementation. This was, this was published about um, two and a half months ago. And L-carnitine is a substance <coughs> that weightlifters use a lot, bodybuilders use, because it's meant to promote lean body mass, a lean muscle mass. And, and again, the assumption is the more the better. Your body can, can just you know, build up all that good muscle and it's all good. The study showed that the L-carnitine is metabolized by the bacteria in the colon in the same way that red meat is. And we know already that red meat is associated with atherosclerosis and heart disease, but now they've also determined that L-carnitine supplementation causes atherosclerosis by the same mechanism. So it is fascinating that we thought what, what we thought was neutral or beneficial may actually have the, the effects that we were never looking for in the first place. So there is very new data, new, new, new data. In fact, this whole, this whole talk today really started about two years ago. The, the, oh, the, the interest in, in the intestinal bacteria, it was interesting, you know, it was, it was pocketed in little, in little scientist communities, but it really hit the mainstream only about two years ago. And so our knowledge on the, the normal bacteria is actually quite poor. But what studies have been done on the differences between um, younger people and older people, or men and women, is that as we age, it appears that we have reduced anaerobes and bifidobacteria in our colons, and we, we start to grow more enterobacter and endotoxin-producing gram-native bacteria like E. coli. Why is this? The authors don't, don't speculate, but is it because that our environments are different, our hormones are different, or is it because our diets change generally as we age? We tend to eat out more, we tend to eat um, more, more convenience foods, so who knows yet, hopefully we will discover what, why this is, but there does tend to be a shift in the type of bacteria from young to old. <coughs> And gender differences are even less well understood. We do know that women on average have a higher stool pH. And this is, this is sort of counterintuitive because women tend to eat more fruits and vegetables than men do. And that should result in a lower stool pH, so closer to, to uh, a negative number. Um, but in fact, it's closer to zero in the alkaline scale. And this may have a role in how often women get irritable bowel syndrome. And irritable bowel syndrome is a, is a syndrome, it's not quite a disease yet because we don't know enough about it, but irritable bowel syndrome is quite common in women. And is it due to the estrogen production? Is it due to the acidic or, or the more neutral pH of our stool? We don't know yet, but there are gender differences in, in stool and in diseases. This is kind of funny, because even, the, even what we do for a living has an impact on our stool, um, on, our, on our GI tract bacteria. And some, some really um, curious researchers did the bacterial strains on ranchers and found that the ranchers shared intestinal bacterial types with their cattle and their sheep. So there's a lot of cross, we'll call it contamination, that's probably too strong of a word, but there's, there's a lot of crosstalk even between species. So stop kissing your cows. <laughs> <laughs> now let's move on to, to diet and how our diet impacts it, our, colon, our colon environment. There are basically three main groups of, of bacteria and we'll call them environments in, in humans. And, and these are very balanced environments, these are healthy environments, but, but most humans fall into one of these three categories. 
either bacteroides, and these are these are people who tend to eat a high protein diet, high animal diet, and uh, high saturated fats. There are the Prevotella group, which are induced by a diet high in carbs and sugars, and the Ruminococcus groups, which, strangely enough, I couldn't find a whole lot of data on those guys, so I don't know, maybe grass. And, <laughs> and so the, what we eat really dictates who we are, so that, again, there's a whole lot of truth in we are what we eat. Our microbiota is generally consistent through life. We have about 60% of our bacteria in our colon that really don't change. And about another 40% that does change as a result of our diet, our, um, our emotional well-being, if we take antibiotics or if we take other medicines. So there's about a 40% play there on, on species. And and this is, this is where a lot of the information is, is going to, is, is trying to balance obesity with leanness or obesity with starvation. Because while America is suffering from obesity, there's a lot of, of countries in the world that are malnourished. They are not getting the nutrients from their food that they need. So when we look at people who are lean, we can, with very good certainty, determine that they have more bacteroides in their, in their colon as opposed to the firmicutes. Now these are just large groups of types of bacteria. The, the bacteroides group tends to absorb less energy from their food and they stay lean. So they actually are more um, they're more efficient at, at their burning. Interestingly, people who are obese, who, who are more likely to have this group of bacteria in their colon, they actually absorb more energy from their food. So a calorie is not a calorie to a lean person compared to an obese person. Obese persons are going to hang on to that calorie more. They're going to get more calories out of their fat and their foods. They're going to have, they're going to have a better chance of, of pulling um, calories out. So, so that's, that's interesting. We can modify which group we're in by how many calories we eat and how much fat and carbs and, and um, just overall, overall uh, energy intake. So if we, if we eat less with a lower fat, lower carb intake, we can shift ourselves into this group. Whereas if we <coughs> eat more and we become more obese, we shift ourselves into this group. So we can go back and forth with that 40% of the bacteria that we have to play with. The scientists have been able to show that if you take people and you don't know, if you, if you blind yourself to, to their diseases, you can tell by their colon bacteria what diseases they have. Specifically, you can tell if they have metabolic syndrome or diabetes because there are very specific bacterial groups that tend to take up shock in people with those disorders. And there's also very interesting data to show that people who are obese have bacteria that produce more short-chain fatty acids. And we're not going to go into the metabolic processes of short-chain fatty acids, but the presence of those short-chain fatty acids as the food is getting metabolized is that it increases the production of leptin. And leptin is one of the hottest hormones on infomercials right now. And um, so I'm not telling you to go out and take the leptin that's on the infomercial, but, but what I am saying is that the more leptin someone has in their system, the higher the appetite they have, the increased appetite, the more difficult it is to feel satisfied when they eat. So bacteria determine in some part how much leptin and how satisfied we feel when we eat. So take these mice again, right? These poor little sweet mice. I know, and, and they can, they can take mice who are genetically thin. They, they have all of the genes that they need to be thin. And these scientists took these germ-free, genetically thin mice, and they colonized them with the Enterobacter cloaceae. And these genetically thin mice 
gained weight even despite eating fewer calories than they did before. So the bacteria forced them to get more out of their food. They also did little tiny gastric bypass procedures on, on these mice. Little tiny procedures. And, and they took these obese mice, performed a gastric bypass. The gastric bypass changed the bacteria that lived in their colon. They took that bacteria and gave it to obese mice and those mice lost weight. So we, we can tell that humans who have had gastric bypass procedures have drastically different colon bacteria after the procedure and they lose weight not only because of the nutrient um, problems with, with absorption but also because the bacteria themselves are different. So it's not just the bypass, it's actually the whole environment becomes a different environment. So we can take mice and we can change them from fat to thin and from thin to fat. So how do we use this as responsible humans on earth? How do we use this to take care of ourselves? So we are learning to use the bacterial flora to change the nutrient metabolism, to reduce our inflammation, and hopefully reduce the amount of diseases that we have as a result of that, as well as to, to be more lean, less obese, and ultimately healthier. We might be at the point in, in science where we start to transplant stool from lean people to obese people in order to improve their metabolic profiles. It's fine, it's just poop. That's <laughs> all good, don't worry. Just wash your hands. <laughs> so, I realize that you cannot see this, but this is a quick and dirty summary on, on the studies that have been done with specific bacteria and the specific results. So we're going to talk briefly about probiotics and why probiotics as they exist today are not the fountain of youth or the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So there is, there is very good data for certain things, for certain diseases, for certain endpoints with certain bacteria. Having said that, let me define clearly what a probiotic is. Probiotics are live microorganisms which administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit to the host. Now I'm gonna pause there and say, probiotics are not always healthy. Years ago, they did studies in ICUs where they had patients who had raging pancreatitis. They gave those people probiotics assuming that it would help to restore their inflammatory functions, you know, reduce inflammation, make them healthier. Those people died. So there are people who should not take live bacteria and there are situations where it's not appropriate. The same benefits. The colony forming units, in order to be therapeutic, have to be obeyed. And that's the data that we don't have right now. I can't tell you that two tablets are gonna help you versus one tablet. I, we just don't have that data. So dose matters in terms of, of taking in outside bacteria. And, and then thirdly, the rule of, for the probiotic is it has to survive the ingestion. So you can consume bacteria all day, but if it's all destroyed by your stomach acid and it never makes its way down to your colon, then it doesn't do anything. It's just food, right? There are certain foods that do provide bacteria, live bacteria, that can make it to our colons. And that includes sauerkraut, kimchi, some pickles, yogurts, kefir, miso. But what we consume in, in our just regular you know, grocery stores is pasteurized. So those are sterile things. So don't go out and buy a bunch of pickles and, and think that you're gonna eat yeah. probiotics because it's <laughs> sterile. If we do it at home or if we follow certain um, recipes, then we can make our own probiotics. But um, generally you wanna make sure that it doesn't explode in your refrigerator because it gets a little messy. Um, and, and then finally, regarding probiotics, 
it probably won't make a difference if you consume a whole bucket full of probiotics if you don't change the environment in the colon. If you continue to eat you know, too much meat or too many sweets or too much artificial sweetener, all the probiotics in the world aren't going to live. They're not going to take hold. So a lifestyle change in order to allow those probiotics to stay in and actually regenerate um, is necessary. Now let's talk about prebiotics. We've heard this term. We've already used the term in reference to breast milk with the oligosaccharides being a prebiotic. And a prebiotic is simply an ingredient that acts as food to the intestinal bacteria. And it resists degradation by the host, it undergoes fermentation by the intestinal microbes, and it stimulates the growth or activity of intestinal microorganisms. And examples of this, again, with breast milk, leeks, asparagus, Jerusalem artichokes, artichokes, wheat, soybean, bran, um, and the less process that prebiotic is the better so um, still still cut oats are better than um, instant oats so that kind of that kind of idea and a lot of times manufacturers will add in prebiotics to our breakfast bars such as the fructo oligosaccharides or inulin is an example of the FOS's and then uh, galacto oligosaccharides so when we when we purchase things that says has prebiotics in it these are just simply um, things that our bacteria like to chew on and, and become more, um, more nutritious. What is the future of, of our therapies from here on out? We know that antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, kill everything. They kill the good stuff, they kill the bad stuff. And then we're left with Clostridium difficile, and we're left with chronic abdominal pain, and we're left with all these things that occur when we disturb such a delicate balance. So, possibly the future is is to add back some good bacteria, so that those good bacteria can take hold and start to edge out the bad guys. And these products are already on the market, not necessarily for the gut, but look at this. We've got we've got a moisturizer, a face moisturizer. Maybe that's going to help with acne. I can't say. I can make no product endorsements, but it's fascinating. The concept is fascinating. The Luvina product is one actually that we, we do promote, which restores or adds the, we'll call them food, to the, 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 the bacteria in the vagina so that there are fewer bacterial vaginosis episodes and fewer urinary tract infections. So we know already that these products can help to restore somewhat of a more natural balance. Now, I want to applaud the first people who allowed themselves to be transplanted with fecal matter. Because this has occurred um, upwards of 700 times already in the United States. So this has been done for years and years. Um, probably didn't talk about it at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> but this is probably more state of the art than anything that I've talked about in this lecture so far. We are doing it here in Amarillo, we meaning other people. And <laughs> um, Dr. Kaswani over at Texas Tech has done some fecal transplants. The purpose of the fecal transplant so far is to recolonize people who have had drug-resistant Clostridium difficile infections. So C. diff infections, which can be brutal and terribly difficult to eradicate because, as I showed you in the very beginning, bacteria like to get up in the little nooks and crannies of our colon walls. And antibiotics have a very difficult time eradicating those. And, and then it kind of, the C. diff kind of hides out and waits for the antibiotic to go away and then it jumps out again. And this is, the, the, the fecal transplants are a way to add back the good bacteria. The, the, the transplant, the donors, are people like you and me. They just do it better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they drop off their stool sample. Now time is of the essence because we've already talked about it, it has to be live and it has to be, um, it has to be good bacteria. And, and they put it in a blender and they blend it up and they put it through some cheesecloth or some coffee filters or something and get the, get the chunks out. And then it can be placed in by one of two methods. It can either be placed in by a, a colonoscope 
and, and it, the, the, the GI doctor can just place it in and squirt it out and then that's it. It takes about five minutes or it can be placed by, by NG tube. So a tube that goes through the nose and then it's set up. It's all good. <laughs> it's just poop. <laughs> And, and it, it will be deposited into the colon. Now, I, I understand the oohs and ahs and the grosses, but if you are a person who is suffering from Clostridium difficile chronic infection, you'll do anything. And this might actually be a matter of life and death. So it's cheap and it's safe as long as you have a clean donor, someone who doesn't have parasites and things like that. But it is, it is, it's so simple. How come we didn't do this before? So let's summarize by what can we do now, knowing what we know? What can we use bacteria for? We, the scientists, can generate bacteria that can stimulate the endocrine system, possibly to produce insulin, or we might be able to stimulate the intestinal system, the, the GI tract, to create neurotransmitters and treatment of anxiety and depression. The sky's the limit as to what we can do using these bacteria that we already have, we're carrying with us right now. We need to be able to produce highly selective, non-absorbable antibiotics so that we can target the bad guys and, get, and keep the good guys. We need to be able to invent drugs to alter the way that the bacteria talk to each other and make, make the, the ground cover stronger and get rid of the weeds. We need to be able to manipulate probiotics and understand what goes where and what it's going to do so that we don't harm ourselves in the process. We can probably use stool transplants to control obesity, but we might even use stool transplants to control starvation and malnutrition. So there is a wide open potential for the bacteria in our lives to make us healthier and better. So that's the end of my talk. And I welcome any questions. Earlier that, that sometimes and some people with good bacteria doesn't have a chance to get into the colon to right. do what it needs to. What keeps it from getting to where it needs to? It gets absorbed before it gets in? It could be, it, yeah, it could be the, the transit time is, is too fast. It could be that the colon itself is so inflamed that there's no receptors for that bacteria to actually grab onto. It's, it's, a, it's an invitation that the, that the gut lining extends and then the bacteria say, okay, and then they, they, they connect to each other. So if there's no connections, then there's not gonna be, be that, that colonization. Probiotic yogurt or prebiotic yogurt. Is that on the market? There is. Dan has a product. There are lots of different products. There's a lot of debate as to whether those work. The company, of course, has their own sponsored studies that says, yes, it's great. You know, a line is a product. Um, it, the, the capsules. What's the one that the actress pushes? Activia. Activia. Um, so there are several on the market, and you'll hear both ways in terms of anecdotal evidence. But, but right now we have to be fairly skeptical about the, the, the bacteria effects in the yogurt cultures now. Um, <coughs> yes, they are live. Yes, they probably get to the colon, but the end result is still somewhat up in the air. So are they pasteurized, what we buy? They are, but they, they do, they are live. So I don't know what the process is, and, and maybe they pasteurize it before, and then they add it back. I, I don't know what the process is. So if you weren't breastfed, mm -hmm. what can you do to balance your risk? You know, I think if there's one take-home point from this whole lecture is, if we eat foods that are less processed, more fruits, more vegetables, more complex carbs, um, more smart proteins, that we will be able to adjust our colon bacteria to, to be as healthy as possible. You, you, we can't turn back time, but we can take control now and not harm what's already in there. And in fact, you know, provide enough nutrients to, to really blossom out the good stuff. So are you much of a believer of the actual um, probiotic supplements? No, not yet. Not yet. So what about the fermented stuff? Like well, the fermented stuff, I think, is, I think is, is probably right on. You know, when you think back 
before we had all the antibiotics and this obsession with san sanitation, um, cultures did a lot of fermenting. And for the most part, they did quite well. And so I do think that there is a, a large role in, in healthy fermented products. Yes. yes. What about organic versus non-organic? There's, there's really, that, that, is a, that is a very hot topic. There are ecological answers to that. There are economic reasons to that. But in reference to health, in, for this lecture, I would say there's no difference between organic and, and regular, regularly grown foods. In fact, if we eat organic, there's a good chance we're gonna, we're gonna starve the rest of the world because it takes so much land to, to produce organic fruits and vegetables that we just are not gonna be able to feed the world if we do it that way. Yes. Oh, you mentioned fermenting products. <laughs> but then alcohol, fermented, is that right? It's not the same. It's not the same because, because the, the ethanol is, is toxic. So we don't get drunk bacteria. We get dead bacteria. Some of the yogurts have a lot of sugar added. That's a good point. That's a very good point. So the sugar in those yogurts, the artificial sweeteners in those yogurts, all the fillers. Yeah, there's the rub. And um, so while the study, that UCLA study, did show that there were cognitive changes as a result of the, of the bacterial cultures, you know, those, those yogurts probably are a lot of hoo-ha. If, if we really did it right, if we were really smart about it, we would actually make our own yogurt. We would make our own yogurts. There is one yogurt that has no sugar and no fat. Yeah, that's, that's uh -huh. the green yogurt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I do like that. I think it's uh, Fahe is what the, what the label says. And that does appear to be less preservative added. It, it does appear, but I can't, I, I have not seen any studies. I cannot reference with any sort of. But <coughs> there wouldn't be a negative. Effect of that. No, no. I think I think you'd be you best off. My my humble opinion, and it's totally an opinion, would be the the Greek yogurts with the fresh fruits. That's going to be your best bet. Then you're going to get your prebiotics. You're going to get your live bacteria cultures. That would be that would be a smart way to to try to, to to consume yogurts. Yes. Do you like spas? as part of the detox program, suggest you know, colonics or chronic cleansing. Uh, what you read, good, bad, and different? Colonic cleansing has been a, a fad for a couple hundred years. And, and so we, we have this concept that the colon's a dirty place. And it's really not. The colon and the liver are really self-cleaning mechanisms. So if we do it right, if we eat good foods, and we drink water and we evacuate regularly, the colon is a very happy place. Colonics probably get rid of a lot of the good bacteria. They also introduce some bacteria into locations where they shouldn't be. So one of the slides actually I took out showed that there were there are regions of the colon where bacteria like to like to group. And so in colonics, you're really mixing all that all that together. And so I, I do not think that colonics are necessary. They may actually be harmful and they do not aid it at all in weight loss. The children born by C-section have a higher rate of allergies and asthma. Right. And you're saying because it's, they don't go through the birth canal? Well, you know, it's impossible, it's impossible at this point to show cause and effect. We can show associations. And, and it appears that the, the establishment of a, of a different colonic environment changes the way the immune system views the world from that point forward. So, so there is, there's a very, very close cause and effect to that, but, but it's, a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing that we do you know, when we change what Mother Nature did for us. I have three C-sections, mm -hmm. my middle child does some asthma and allergies. There's, there's lots and lots of, of studies to be done. And, and, you know, if there's one thing that, that probably happened to me in preparing this talk is I have 400 more questions. <laughs> yes. 
so that seems like that might be a really good place for the the stool transplant would it be for children born by C section. Perhaps, perhaps. Actually, a lot of the neonatal units use probiotics to try to get in some, you know, to protect those kids from being the germ-free mice, yeah. basically. Yeah. My grandparents came from the Middle East, and we always made our own yogurt. Mm -hmm. We'd always save it a little bit for a starter. Right. And it's really easy to make. But there's one I found that's really close to that, mm -hmm. and it's it's a Bulgarian yogurt in a jar. You can buy it at the healthy store. A Bulgarian a, yogurt in a jar in a, a glass store. jar. In a glass and jar. It's really close to what my grandmother made. Yeah. So. So I'll see you at Natural Grocers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming today. When are you going to do another one? Well, I, I, I'm not sure what time it's going to be, but my next topic is going to be the science of contraception. <laughs> <laughs>